طيب Very large topic, Dr. Helmut. <laughs> it's a conference, actually. <laughs> yes, I hope that I will not be too long. I mean, I'm, um, but I'm, we'll see. No, for us, yeah, I mean, it's a pleasure. Dr. Majid, you can start now, please. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, today, uh, the, we are happy to join uh, with the doctor, uh, with Professor uh, Helmut about uh, highlighting the Neurology 2020. And also I will come to uh, Prof. Uh, um, uh, Mahmoud Sabri and Dr. Shirin and all of you to uh, uh, with uh, this uh, beautiful uh, webinar with Dr. with the Professor Helmut. Please, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, prof. Helmut, welcome. And we are, uh, uh, we are a pleasure uh, to join uh, with you this uh, lecture. Yes, hello, hello, uh, and good evening to all those listening and uh, watching. First of all, thanks very much to Saudi German Hospital for once again inviting me to give this webinar that I gave the first one six months ago. Um, and thanks for inviting me for a second one. And when uh, they asked me for a title, I thought maybe it's worthwhile to um, give you my personal selection of the highlights in Neurology 2020. Um, I have no disclosures to make, so no company uh, pays me for what I'm going to tell you in the next 40 minutes. Um, the only honorarium that I receive is a very small one from Saudi German Hospital for this talk. So don't worry, no conflicts of interest at all. I will cover these eight major um, topics from neurology, um, which I'm not going to read in order to save time. So I will present you the, let's say, one, two, or three uh, most interesting papers that I have um, read last year, maybe also some of them also November, December 20, 2019, about these eight big topics of neurology. Um, now the slides are always, the anatomy of the slides is always like this. Up here you find the topic I'm talking about. Up here you find the data that were um, published in the paper that I'm talking about. And down here you see the message, my message that I um, concluded from, from the work that I'm going to present. So now maybe um, you think now, well, what? He's talking about eight things in neurology, but not talking about COVID-19, which was, of course, a major thing in 2020. Well, OK, I will, for, to start, before I go into the eight major topics, I will start with COVID. Um, that's the logo of my hospital here in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, we have changed this uh, logo this year to, to this one. Um, those are the small viruses just about to enter your nasal epithelium up here. You see, those are the SARS-CoV-2 viruses entering the, na the nasal epithelium. And of course, I will start a talk about 2020. Cannot start without talking about COVID-19. So what was um, going on in COVID-19? This is, the, I would say, the picture uh, of the year for me. Uh, that's, a, that's a case report. Uh, from JAMA Neurology that was published in, in early summer or late springtime, single case 
you see in the inflammation of the uh, olfactory bulbs in both uh, on both sides, and you also see an encephalitis, a focal encephalitis of the uh, rec of the gyral rectus, gyrus rectus, on, on especially on the right side. So that's a very impressive single case. I can tell you, ha having seen a, a number of COVID patients this year, this is a very rare event. Um, but it's a, it's something that highlights 2020 uh, from the infectiological perspective. Single case from. Um, Milano, as you know, one of the hotspots, especially in the beginning of the pandemic in Europe, the northern Italian region. So, um, of course, this encephalitis or neuritis of the, of the first um, cranial nerve causes anosmia and loss of uh, taste also. In, um, that's the, the papers this year were very, um, had, had very confusing data, between 5% in the first cases from China, but I can tell you those were the sickest patients uh, and many of them weren't even able to tell you that they didn't um, smell or taste or, yes. Uh, and and the, the, the publications that have really um, looked into that more, more in more detail and had not as, as severely sick patients, they reported 98%. So almost all have it as soon as you really look for it. So are there any other, let's say, specific neurological um, problems in COVID-19? I mean, there's a big hype and everybody tells you about this. In the beginning, I thought and many thought there may be um, an increased incidence of Guillain-Barré syndrome that was also reported from Northern Italy, from, from Brescia. Um, but I can tell you the more population-based reports, the last one from, from United Kingdom, published in Brain the, in December 14, uh, let's, uh, did not confirm that it, it, in, in UK, it even looked as if there were less cases of, um, of Guillain-Barré syndrome found during summer and um, early autumn 2020, and also springtime 2020. So, that didn't really um, come out as it first looked. Uh, in 3,500 3, patients um, published in stroke this year from New York City, there were 0.9% strokes. So I don't know whether this is really a significant finding. I mean, it's, it's, you, you probably have, have some cases, some stroke cases in any severely, uh, in, in any population, patient cohorts that are severely infected by whatever kind of disease. So 0.9% strokes in the severely affected New York inpatient cohort um, that was associated with a more severe cause of stroke. So the prognosis of stroke is worse in those simultaneously infected with COVID-19. Uh, it's always, most of them were associated with systemic inflammatory states making plausible why they suffered their stroke and of course with high co coagulable state. I mean, that's a problem in COVID as you know, that um, people get thrombosis wherever in veins and arteries and of course also in, in the brain. So not probably not a significant finding I would say. And other um, findings also I would say are more likely due to uh, a severe infectiological condition than to a specific COVID or SARS-CoV-2 infection of, let's say, the peripheral or central nervous system. You get some cases on cephalopathy, of course. Uh, you get myopathy, uh, you get seizures, you get mild cognitive impairment, fatigue, even some cases report about rhabdomyolysis. So this, this happens, but I'm not quite sure if this is really COVID-specific or whether it's, it's, a, it's an epiphenomenon of a severe systemic inflammatory condition. And, um, as a sort of um, support of that, uh, there was no post-mortem evidence in the, in the paper recently published in the Lancet Neurology, where they had, uh, had 42 brains um, histo histopathologically examined after having died from or with uh, COVID-19, and they found no evidence of direct CNS damage. They, of course, they have some strokes, they have some um, from both vessels, but no evidence of direct viral CNS damage. So my conclusion, um, neurological conclusion from that is 
that we have a mainly pulmonary and multisystemic condition with the usual neurological um, accompaniments, with the exception of smell and taste. That's a specific neurological thing. So um, this was the real impact of COVID-19 on neurology, uh, published in the, in the New England Journal in early summer, uh, showing you the use of the rapid software. That, that's a software many big hospitals in the United States, maybe also in your countries use. We also use them. And, um, and the, the, the company offering this software has access to uh, the numbers of use per day of their software. And the, here you see that uh, in a number of, of tertiary high end care hospitals uh, treating stroke in the United States, you had, you had a steady increase of rapid software use during uh, the, the last year before, uh, in the beginning of March, the first um, deaths and the declaration of the pandemic state by the WHO uh, happened. And at that, during that time, um, the use of the COVID, uh, of the rapid software increased, but then it dropped by 30%. And that, that's an observation um, that has been made in the subsequent months in all countries that I know of in Europe and in, in including Germany, everybody um, saw uh, up to 30% abrupt drop in the, in, the, in, the, in the cases of acute stroke um, reaching the hospital. Um, and that, that's, an, that's a phenomenon which is, which is not really well understood. Um, one explanation certainly is that the patients were worried to get COVID in the hospital, so they stayed at home, especially with the with a more mild uh, stroke symptoms, they stayed at home. But another problem probably in some countries was also that the whole emergency system didn't work as well and the patient, patients didn't reach the hospitals. Some of them also isolated in, in nursery um, facilities didn't even reach hospitals. So this was the main impact of COVID-19 on neurology, I would say, in 2020, the drop in acute cases, especially stroke, by up to 30%, which is also imposes an economic problem for many of us uh, who are not re, uh, reimbursed for things like that uh, by their governments. So that was um, COVID-19 in 2020 to me. Let me say all the uh, papers that I'm going to present you are very personal selections of what I read and I have seen. So you may have had other impressions that it's just a very personal selection. So the next three papers I'm going to present are um, from the field of dementia. As um, most of you will know, uh, several trials in the year years before 2020 failed, especially of focusing Alzheimer disease and focusing the amyloid load of the brain and Alzheimer's thought. There were some disappointments in previous years and there was no really, not, not really a, um, a dramatic or a sensational therapeutic paper in 2020 that I have seen. Uh, but there are a number of interesting publications on dementia nevertheless. Most of them are um, on new risk factors and on uh, improved diagnostics and on biomarkers. And that's what I'm going to present you now in three papers that I will show you. So the first was, uh, was this one published in the Lancet. It's by the Lancet Commission. That's, I would say, I showed you the picture of the year to me was the COVID picture with the nasal uh, affection, the upper um, bulb, olfactory bulbs. That was the picture of the year, I would say. The paper of the year to me was this one. And I will show you why in, in a moment, because they looked, they did a, did a very large meta-analysis um, of population-based studies from many countries all over the world. Most of them high-income countries, or all of them high-income countries, because they have a good epidemi epidemiology that provides such data. So from this meta-analysis, they calculated population attributable risks. That's something most of you will know. That's the percentage of the incidence of a disease that's attributable to a risk factor or a number of risk factors. Let's say, as you all know, stroke can be explained, 80% of stroke can be explained by a number of risk factors. Most of them 
uh, modifiable, some of them not. Um, so 40% of stroke is attributable to high blood pressure, for instance, and so on and so on. And they did the same uh, for uh, dementia and they calculated this very interesting 12 risk factor life course model of dementia. And I show you uh, what this implies, a picture from the Lancet. Uh, and they divided our life into the early period, the midlife period and the late life period. And they looked into what are risk factors for late life dementia in early life. You see, there's only one risk factor in early life, but that's 7% um, of late life dementia. So early life, less education in the early phase of life explains in this model, 7% of the late life cases of dementia. That, that's very interesting. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't have guessed that. So meaning just, um, the baseline you go into your life with, so, so the cognitive baseline, also determines how um, fast you can get dementia because you have learned less simply. And so um, losing something means earlier dementia for those who have le haven't learned enough. So 7% explaining um, late life dementia. The next thing in midlife, very interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that 8% in midlife um, of late life dementia can, re can be attributed to bad hearing. Um, um, interesting discussion why. My personal explanation is because the brain is no longer stimulated as well as it is when you uh, hear normally. Um, very interesting. There's no similar thing for vision, interestingly. Uh, it's hearing is obviously a main determinant of um, the time when you get uh, dementia. Traumatic brain injury, not very surprising. I would say only 2% hypertension. I would have guessed that's more. Only 1% alcohol, at least in our countries. 1% um, obesity, so that's not very much. So you see 7% and 8% factors that I wouldn't have guessed uh, before I had read this um, publication. So late life, uh, risk factors are smoking, not very surprising because of vascular disease, of course. But again, here you see depression and social isolation, uh, four percent each, and this is of course uh, corrected for all other risk factors. That's always adjusted for all the other risk factors. So again, eight percent um, due to depression and social isolation may probably having to do with less normal stimulation of the brain and other things, air pollution, interestingly, 2%, um, um, diabetes, not surprising, ending up with a potentially 40% um, a, a population attributable risk due to these 12 factors. All of them are modifiable by political and health um, political um, measures. So that was an interesting paper um, to me. And I'll come up with the next, which, um, you know, in Germany right now, um, the, I think it's the 17th day of the Bundesliga soccer. A uh, very interesting paper was this one. And this is not about American football, where similar things have been observed pre in previous years. That's about the European, English, Arabic, normal soccer play, uh, which was published in the New England Journal. Um, although I must say it's professional soccer. It's not amateur soccer, what you and me and other people may like uh, to play from time to time. But this is a Scottish study, a retrospective study, I must say, where they identified 7,600 uh, former Scottish um, professional soccer players and did a very careful adjustment for their risk factors, which could explain dementia and looked into uh, this comparison with control, matched control groups. And what they reported in this paper is really amazing. Uh, the soccer players had a five times higher risk of getting uh, late life Alzheimer's disease. They had a four times higher risk of getting motor neuron disease. They also had a less uh, increased risk of getting Parkinson's, resulting in a 3.5 higher risk of getting, of getting any of these neurodegenerative conditions in late life. Very interesting question what this um, might be due to, probably um, um, repeated microtrauma could be. Um, the, the, one should be careful, it's retrospective, so it should be confirmed, of course, prospectively, but a very interesting thing 
uh, underscoring the probable relevance of trauma um, for late life dementia and even of repeated microtrauma, uh, in this case of soccer. Next thing um, is into biomarkers. So, um, of course, one very interesting or important thing, especially in Alzheimer's and other um, neurodegenerative conditions, is to get good biomarkers um, that let you predict um, which members of the population will develop the disease in the future, because treatment is probably, once we have it, uh, pre 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 treatment is probably only effective in those who are in the very early uh, or even pre-symptomatic phase of, for example, Alzheimer's disease. And um, on, in the search of uh, such biomarkers, this was a very interesting paper here uh, that I'm going to, to go to explain to you in a moment. You know, we have some quite good biomarkers. We can do CSF analysis for uh, a beta, we or tau content in the CSF, but of course you have to lumbar puncture in the, in the entire population to get that. You can do amyloid PET or tau PET, but who is thinking of, 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 of such methods as screening methods in the future? It's impossible. So and considering that, this was a very interesting paper. It's, it's a blood measurement of plasma phosphor tau 217 for Alzheimer, for Alzheimer's disease. The paper was published in the JAMA in August. Um, and I will show you two findings from this paper, which uh, are quite interesting. The first is this, uh, the first, uh, the, the, the population they scan was, was made of were, were three cohorts. The first cohort is a neuropathology cohort of 81 patients with dementia, uh, of which probably the half, approximately the half had Alzheimer's disease, which was confirmed post-mortem, histopathologically confirmed. And they calculated the Tangle density score. That's the Alzheimer defining uh, histopathological um, thing made of tau, uh, the tangles. And what you can see here that is those with the highest Tangle density scores clearly had the highest um, plasma phosphor tau 217 concentrations before they uh, died in, in the years before they died. The same shown here. So very interesting thing. At least those with the high tangle density scores can be uh, predicted before they die uh, from their plasma measurements of phosphor tau 217. Um, the second cohort in this paper, the, that was a clinical cohort where they, from Sweden, where they had 220 patients. Um, they had, did not have histopathological data for them, but they had tau PET, amyloid PET, and all the CSF biomarkers. So a very high likelihood of being correct in the clinical plus um, laboratory supported diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And again, they had the same finding in a different cohort, this time from Europe, um, where they found the plasma phosphor tau 217 to be a very good predictor of Alzheimer's disease. That results in this receiver operator characteristics, where you see here the curve for plasma tau 217 with the by far best area under the curve, um, telling you something about the validity and the predictive value of this measurement. And the area under curve was clearly the best for plasma tau compared to um, other things, including um, MR measurements, let's say of hippocampal volume shown here, or plasma neurofilament concentration or other measurements of the brain based on MRI. So my conclusion from this uh, written down here is high plasma tau 217 discriminates Alzheimer's disease from non-Alzheimer's disease better than MRI. And it will have to be investigated whether this also is maybe true for the early phases or the pre-symptomatic phases um, of this condition. Of course, you may say, well, that's not very relevant because we don't have any causal treatment for Alzheimer's disease. That's true. But um, as you know, um, this may change in the future. And um, proof of principle for that, for being able to treat neurodegenerative conditions was, as you all know, in the years before 2020, spinal muscular atrophy, where we have a molecular treatment. Um, and the same may be happening believe it or not, for uh, the next thing that I'm going to address for uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I personally have never, would have never thought 
that that's may ever in my lifetime may become a treatable disease. And of course, it's not causally treatable uh, as we sit here today, but things may change. And there was one example of this proof of principle that things may change that I will show you uh, now. That was also published in the New England Journal, um, phase one trial, I would tell, dose finding trial of an antisense oligonucleotide, in this in case, tofazane. That's the same thing as we have, they have found for SMA, not the nuzinazine treatment of SMA, which also works in the adults, by the way. That was another paper in 2020, which I'm not going to show you for SMA, but that's the same principle now for ALS. Um, in this case, by an uh, antisense oligonucleotide for the SOT1, the superoxid dismutase 1 uh, gene, gene product, um, which that's the negative thing, explains in Europe at least 2% of the ALS cases. So it's, it's not an explanation of the entire problem of ALS, but um, as a start, it explains 2% of all uh, ALS cases that we see in Europe and in the United States. So, and for those 2%, this is proof of principle. They compared in this small numbers of patients uh, four doses of this new ASO, as we term it, antisense oligonucleotide, comparing it to placebo. The endpoint uh, was, of course, not clinical endpoints, but it was the SOT1 concentration in the CSF. They did five lumbar punctures during three months, um, injecting the drug and um, Estim or determining the SOT1 concentra concentration in CSF. And what you see here, that at least in the highest dose, of the azotofazine, the SOT1 concentration goes down. Uh, it's, a, it's a gain of function mutation. So the patients have too much SOT1 and bringing it down is, an, is, an, uh, is a goal of treatment. And that's um, at least considering this endpoint achieved here. Of course, they also did clinical investigations, AF ALS scores. And what you at least see here, it's not significant, but it's an interesting trend that those uh, with a high dose tofazane treatment remain stable during three months, but uh, most of those with the placebo or lower dosages um, deteriorated as is uh, to be expected in this uh, fatal disease. So an interesting proof of principle, and there are other genes involved in ALS, and maybe we will see other papers uh, targeting these other genes in ALS in the next years. So very interesting future. So what's going on in Parkinson's? We unfortunately have no similar um, progress in Parkinson's, so we still have no molecule um, where we hope um, Parkinson will be treated with, but we have a new method and that was something that um, I found interesting. That was a paper on, on Christmas 2020. First, this here, that's focused ultrasound. That, that's a new method which is already approved in the United States, uh, FDA approved for treating essential trauma. Uh, you can focus the ultrasound beams from various, various directions um, and thereby heat the brain tissue in one tiny spot, uh, one tiny target where the beams are focused on. Um, this is, this is um, monitored by MR thermometry. So very interesting new technique. And the first paper now, um, beyond essential tremor um, that was, was published on, on uh, Christmas uh, 2020. That's a randomized trial of focused ultrasound, FUS, um, subtelemotomy. Sub so the same target uh, that, that you target with for deep brain stimulation. But in this case, of course, targeting with focused ultrasound. So you destroy parts of the nucleus uh, subthalamicus in order to improve Parkinson's disease. And they did it with a sham procedure that's easy to do with focused ultrasound. You can do a sham treatment and a true treatment. And what you found that uh, over the first 12 months, the sham treated group uh, stayed the same in their UPDRS part three motor score as you would expect one year or in this form, case four months of Parkinson's without causal treatment. Um, you don't get much better. And the treated group uh, improved uh, over the first two months and then stayed on a lower level for the, uh, for the next eight months to come. So interesting new treatment. 
it's, it's probably not superior to deep brain stimulation. Um, but of course, as, as you all can see, it's psychologically um, much more easy to accept for a patient uh, than opening his skull and bringing in electric devices. And of course, it's much more easier. You need less, um, less um, follow up later. And you, it's, it's, it's a single treatment and um, you don't have to care for, for the electrical things and for foreign bodies in the head and things like that. So interesting thing from the field of Parkinson's. Um, epileptic disorders, there was only one paper uh, that um, touched me in epilepsy. Um, and this is something that may, maybe many of you will, will know. It was also in the New England Journal. Um, I don't know which drug you prefer, but I know that um, the, the preferences are very diverse. Um, we prefer levetiracetam, but, but many of you IV, of course, for status epilepticus. Um, but of course, others, United States or you, many of you will um, prefer the, the cheaper drugs uh, such as phenytoin or proic acid. Uh, and they compared it in this study, compared it um, the three forms of treatment with the endpoint. So the patients came in um, by the emergency. They had already received benzodiazepine, but the status didn't stop. Uh, that's all. It was benzodiazepine refractory status epilepticus at admission, and they apply, um, um, they treated the patients in a randomized fashion with these three drugs. And the, ver the result is very simple. All of them worked equally well or equally bad as. Uh, uh, stopping the, the, the status within 60 minutes in approximately 50% of the cases and the rest did not respond and went on to other more aggressive forms of treatment. So interesting paper showing, the, showing you that whatever you preferred in the past, you were right. Doesn't make a difference what you use. Status epilepticus. Um, only one paper in epilepsy that I found um, interesting to report here. So next thing, it's 30 minutes over of my talk. Next thing is demyelinating diseases. And I will give you three papers uh, on multiple sclerosis and three papers on um, neuromyelitis myelitis optica spectrum disorder. Uh, and the year 2020 was in both conditions, was a year of comparative studies. So studies comparing one drug with another one, drug. That this is something we had been waiting for a long time. Most uh, drugs were tested against placebo and you don't really had head to head comparisons uh, of what is better than the other and what, what to use for whom. And this has changed in 2020. And I'll show you uh, six examples of that Th to start with three examples of multiple sclerosis. This is a well-known, you all know it, Fingolimod that had to be tested because the FDA ordered um, that these two doses should be, should be compared, the 0.5 dose, the usual one we're using with the 0.2.5 milligram dose. So this was done, but the interesting thing is not the comparison between these two doses showing that the usual one is the better one. The interesting thing is what it was compared against glatiramea, copaxone. Uh, many of those, many of you do not, are not in the position to have it, but in Germany, of course, it's a quite popular drug. It's a low level activity drug. So, and the result, as you see here, that's the proportion of patients with, um, with relapse. The, the answer to the question is quite clear. Fingolimod prevents more relapses than glatiramea. So head to head comparison of two different drugs. Um, Fingolimod is a S1 piece, sphingosine one phosphate receptor antagonist. The old one, let me say, a new one is coming. I will show you on the next slide. Uh, the old one having the problem that you have some cardiac side effects in the beginning, especially, so that you have to admit the patient that it's in Germany for starting this treatment because they have to be on the monitor for the first day of treatment. So this will change with the next one. That's the follow up, let me say, to Fingolimod. It's the same principle, but works more selectively on this S1P receptor. It's Utsanimod. This is already FDA approved and Europe approved and is probably the next Fingolimod, a little bit better than it because of less side effects. And this was again, uh, this was the study that led to approval of the drug. Utsanimod tested 
against interferon beta, showing that you have in all endpoints a better result with osanimod, less relapses, less MR lesions, less, um, less um, disability progression, whatever you want to look at. So otsanimod better than one interferons. Next, then that's the third of the comparative papers. Um, CD20 antibodies, you all know them. Rituximab is one of label for multiple sclerosis. Ocrelizumab is one on label for multiple sclerosis. And this is the one to come. That's the uh, same principle, same say, uh, CD20 depletion um, in order to um, deactivate uh, relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. Interesting about this drug is that it can be, um, can be uh, um, applied subcutaneously. That makes it interesting. It's not another principle, it's a more easy application. So it will, this one was tested against teriflunamide. Um, so what you see, uh, the message down here, um, there will be no more placebo-controlled trials in multiple sclerosis and also not in NMO as well, because um, that's no longer ethically um, possible to compare um, against placebo in multiple sclerosis. So again, here, let me show it to you. That's in this case, it's not relapse rates, it's disability worsening. And you see there's less worsening of disability with ofatumumab CD20 depletion compared with teriflunamide. All of you know that another comparative study having led to approval of Ozanimod. So the German uh, Neurological Society um, took that to this um, data, these data that I showed you, um, for a new uh, categorization of the MS disease modifying drugs or immunosuppressants. That's the lowest category one where um, Tecfidera is, is in Copaxone, IFN beta, and teriflunamide. That's for the mild cases or maybe for the clinically isolated syndromes. Um, the next, the, the, the a little bit more active cases now are treated with MODs, with the Fingolimod or Ozanimod, which have had quite a quite a good push uh, through the studies that I showed you. So that's the that's the intermediate level of activity leading to an annual relapse rate reduction of 50 to 60 percent with these drugs, compared to 30 highest 50 percent with the lower level drugs. And for the aggressive or the very active cases, we then, and maybe maybe even in the beginning, uh, jump, jump to the CD20 depletion treatment with ocrelizumab or rituximab or ofatumumab in the future. Um, rituximab, you all know, is off-label, so be careful. Um, and in the JCD antibody negative cases, uh, this is according to the German system, still uh, the first choice, natalizumab, Second choice is uh, the CD20 depletion. So that's um, rapid, that's multiple sclerosis, uh, RRMS. Uh, just to show you two uh, negative studies, because that's quite a topic, as I know, in many um, outpatient clinics that you have. That's vitamin D, D3 in MS. This is a study um, looking into um, the cost of MS patients with or without. Um, high dose vitamin D to make a long story short, it's negative. So even this high dose taking daily does not change EDSS progression. It does not uh, reduce the number of relapses per year. So um, I know many of, many of the patients, the female patients especially will continue taking it, but it's scientifically without evidence. So you can do it, but it's unproven. Same thing for fatigue in MS. There, were, there was this big paper just, just a few weeks ago. It's, it's already in the um, 2021 um, year published. Was negative comparing a large number of patients um, with MS fatigue that were, who were treated with amantadine, with modafinil or methylphenidate. Three quite popular drugs for those, um, in Germany at least, complaining of fatigue, but the study scientifically negative, no evidence of benefit. So let's jump to NMO. Um, I have to hurry up. I have only uh, five minutes left now. Uh, NMO, as discussed in MS, 2020 was the year of comparative studies. This is the first one, and this is a retrospective one, I must confess. 
other than in the EMS field, they were all prospective. Here's one retrospective study comparing rituximab um, with these two uh, more conventional or traditional and cheaper drugs, methyl, um, so methyl, um, Mofetil phenola, MMF, as we call it, and azathioprine, of course, those drugs. Uh, and this is the proportion of relapse free patients. So, what you see here after uh, seven years of comparison of these three th th regimens, starting with the disease. So, it's, it's not as they have not switched to these treatments. Patients were put on these treatments, adjusted for disease, disease severity. And what you see here, rituximab has clearly less. Uh, relapses of NMO than with these with these two uh, more traditional than seen with these more traditional drugs. So clear argument for CD20 cell depletion. Uh, there were two other studies, prospective ones, comparing new drugs uh, against older ones in NMO. This is one that's tokilizumab. That's that's a drug approved already for rheumatoid arthritis. It's, it's uh, in Germany at least and United States and Europe approved, also approved for um, giant cell arteritis, tokilizumab. And this is a study, a prospective study comparing tokilizumab with azathioprine in NMO patients. What you see here, a much higher proportion of, the, of the, those treated with tokilizumab stayed um, relapse free after this number of months compared to the um, more conservative uh, treatment with acid thiopin. So a clear argument for tokilizumab, which is an interleukin-6 receptor antagonist, IL-6 receptor antagonist, so far not approved for NMO, but maybe in the future. Um, the one this, with this, that is currently being approved is this one, same kind of action, IL-6 receptor antibody, zata, uh, zatralizumab, um, same kind of action as tokilizumab, tested against placebo, and that's probably the last placebo controlled trial that we will see in NMO and MS, published in the Lancet Neurology just recently, comparing zatralizumab against placebo. The drug was uh, approved in, in, US, in the United States and in Switzerland and will be soon uh, approved in, German, in Europe as well, uh, showing much less relapses in NMO with this IL-6 receptor antagonist than with Placebo. So to make, uh, to stop talking after at least, um, let's say 43 minutes, it's now 40 minutes. I tell you two short things. I was talking about stroke six months ago. There was nothing much in the stroke field in the year of 2020, um, especially not regarding uh, thrombectomy or other acute treatments. So not much going on, um, but two things were interesting. Aspirin is as good as clopidogrel or uh, Tika Grelor. So continue using aspirin in your secondary prevention patients. And the second thing uh, was the LDL target that has been changed to 70 milligram per deciliter following this trial that was published in the beginning of 2020, the treat stroke to target trial, uh, trial comparing or putting patients after a TIA or minor stroke on a 100 milligram target statin treatment or 70 milligram target treatment. And that's uh, the number of uh, stroke recurrences you see here in the lower target group um, is clearly less than the number of stroke recurrences in the higher target group. So in all international guidelines now, the, uh, the LDL target for secondary stroke prevention has been lowered to 70 milligram percent. Um, I have now 42 minutes and Shabit Jane um, said to me, um, don't talk longer than 45. Um, so I'm let, just wondering, uh, let, let me say two things about migraine. So two last two slides. Um, there are two new uh, molecules or groups of molecules in the migraine field. One is the ditans. That's a follow-up uh, development to the triptanes, ditans. They're even more selective than the triptan, triptan, trip, triptanes regarding the serotonin, serotonin receptors, uh, better tolerated. Um, and the GPANs, also interesting molecules uh, targeting the C CGRP um, protein. 
Um, these drugs have been studied and are um, approved for treating migraine attacks, but you see they're not very effective. So that's new, was news of the year 2020, but it's not very, um, not very sensational, this number of responses uh, concerning the endpoint pain-free within two hours. And of course, they're much, much more expensive than the more uh, traditional treatments with two of the best um, triptanes shown here. So new drugs, but they're probably niche products for, for a small number of patients not tolerating uh, triptanes. Um, more interesting seems to be the oral G-pens in uh, migraine prophylaxis. This may become an interesting kind of treatment because um, especially with the higher doses as shown here in this paper from Lancet Neurology in September 2020, you get a reduction of migraine days for, of, by 50% with these oral G-pens, um, practically without uh, side effects compared to placebo. So that's an interesting thing because the group we usually treat with such um, um, medication is young women who do not tolerate well uh, the beta blockers or the topamax or whatever kinds of treatment. So that may be um, an option for the future to come. And that's what I wanted to tell you about these eight topics plus COVID. Thank you very much. And I have talked 45, 44 minutes and 16 seconds. Um, looking forward to a discussion. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Helmut, for this very wonderful and, uh, and heavy information. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, really, if uh, our uh, panelists have any question or comment. Thank you very much, Dr. Helmut. It's uh, very fantastic. Well, uh, yeah, it's very, uh, the, the, the topics that you use and how heavy the dose. Actually, I wish to say, continue. Who is the one telling you 45? <laughs> Please. <laughs> So maybe um, I, I can do the same talk next year, but um, hopefully I meet you before that. Uh, I think uh, I mean, we, we have to plan like a quarterly or <laughs> at least, I mean, every six months. I mean. no, that's too much. Uh, thank you very much for that effort. And actually the, your selection is uh, targeting several points. Um, I wonder also uh, about that stroke, is this, no much in a stroke and no much no much actually in epilepsy also maybe because they are we we got uh, long road before in these two topics before and we have uh, great uh, progress in this so sometimes you have to calm down in certain researches for a while but i think in the coming 2021 much more. I expected. I I I I ask if you share me in epilepsy and in stroke also. Even like the focused ultrasound, I think it could be also of rule with certain technicians and physics. You can target the thrombus in the place, and this could be. Could be. Uh, yes. Um, People have tried that before, and there they had been a number of papers 10 years ago um, with focused transcranial ultrasound, um, and there were positive reports. Some, some, some people continue to do it, but to be honest, I haven't read any, any new um, studies regarding that in the, in the last years. Maybe mm -hmm. I've looked them, but, but, but I don't know. I, it's, it's certainly it's certainly effective, but uh, not as effective, of course, as thrombectomy is. Um, no, I haven't seen anything new recently. But to, to make one comment on what you said, so year 2020 really uh, was a year, and I hope you saw that of uh, re regarding therapeutics of molecular treatments that are about to come. I mean, intelligent molecules targeting very um, focal and specific mechanisms of disease, which are now, now coming up. So molecular medicine is entering neurology. That, that's my impression. Yes, yes. It is fantastic and very clear in your presentation, actually, uh, and this, this approach act, actually lead, might lead more and more toward the specific treatment in the near future. Um, also, I wonder, I don't have any thing about the peripheral neuropathy in your uh, 
series also. I think no, no uh, marvelous show uh, touches your uh, mind or fascinating. Yeah. Um, if, if there would have been um, a paper that touched me, I would have mentioned it. For example, it's still a surprise to me that we have so many progress in MS and NMO, but nothing in CIDP. Another quite frequent uh, peripheral and very devastating peripheral immunological condition, but we don't have similar progress in CIDP as compared to MS or NMO. Uh, but that's probably due to the fact that nobody does uh, trials in that, but because it should be possible to treat it as effectively as the other um, immuno neuroimmunological conditions. But I haven't read any interesting paper about that, so I haven't mm. mentioned it. Right. Uh, maybe my last question for me, but uh, in the era of this COVID that we have, how much the politics and the administration and management, um, I mean the authority-wise, could help or could target, uh, let the scientists able to target neuro bothering neurological disorders? And you see when the, the big companies and the um, uh, rich countries decided to have a vaccine as fast as we can and what they succeeded. So what if collaboration start again against the most uh, deleterious or uh, at least life threatening disorders? Is this could be this cooperation could hasten and they make treatment more faster to be available? Yes, that's true. Um, that's right. I mean, I mean, the vaccination, um, the, the, this fast um, development of vaccinations in many countries all over the world, um, of course, was, uh, was, was mainly due to money given to the companies by, by politicians. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. but, but all the research that I have shown you here today uh, of course, is not driven by politics, um, and it would be, well, of course, they would have to prioritize. Uh, and yeah. One of these topics should be prioritized by a physician, by, by a politician. I mean, I mean, is it is it makes does it make sense to prioritize dementia? Could be, but it's um, it's the oldest part of the population, of course. Um, yeah. But it should it be. Uh, good to prioritize migraine. I mean, that's the condition where most working days are lost in the society due to migraine. I mean, that's another could be another interesting target for a politician. But uh, I think it's I, I I wouldn't go into this if I would be a politician. I I mean, COVID is a thing that's so uh, general to the whole society that's easy to make a political decision to go into that. But otherwise, it's it's I think it's almost impossible. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Shreen, if you wish to have your input. Dr. Shreen, you hearing me? Maybe, but... Hello? You have any comments or questions to Dr. Helmut, Dr. Ashreen? Yeah, I need to ask you uh, one question. Um, during the past uh, year, I saw uh, a few cases, uh, patients presented with COVID, and they have uh, neurological manifestations of uh, encephalitis. They develop the disturbed conscious level, uh, seizures, and uh, auditory and visual hallucinations. We did a CSF for them, and the CSF was normal. The protein's normal, no cells. Uh, we did a panel for infection, including many viruses and uh, bacteria. It was also negative. Uh, the EEG showed uh, diffuse encephalopathy, nothing uh, specific. And uh, some of them even uh, mounted to have status epileptic uh, Once we give the treatment of encephalitis, uh, a mix of antiviral antibiotics, they were improved plus the treatment of COVID. Uh, do you think uh, um, the virus itself would have uh, led to this or just a coincidence? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, um, of course, 
cases like this may happen. But um, my, my question to you would be, are you really sure that this is encephalitis? Uh, if you have if no cells in the CSF, and um, it, it, could, it could equally be um, a from, um, hypercoagulable state disturbing the microcirculation in the brain and in other organs as well, and the patient gets all what you mentioned, status epilepticus, uh, um, confusional states, uh, coma, whatever you like. So um, in, the, in the papers that have looked into post-mortem brains, they did not find any evidence so far of mm -hmm. the virus uh, attacking the brain directly. Mm -hmm. And I would say you see things like that in, in many uh, severe uh, in systemic infections, I mean, yes. and, and coma and things like that. So uh, my opinion as of today is that most of that reported as COVID related is of course COVID related, but yes. not do a, dire, do a direct attack of the virus on the brain or the peripheral nervous system. So it's just encephalopathy and not encephalitis. Yes, that's what I think. Yes, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, look, uh, Prof. Helmut, there is one question. Can I uh, mention it? There is uh, one question from a uh, participant. Uh, he, uh, he said uh, regarding the LDL, which is 70 milligram uh, per deciliter. So what is the, about the HDL? Is there is any preferable uh, target level in order to decrease drop in the future? And the second mm -hmm. Nobody ha has investigated the HDL. So it's unknown. It's unknown whether it, is, it, it's, it has any effect to uh, elevate the HDL. So we don't know. Nobody has studied that. Okay, the second question, what is the, bio the best uh, biological therapy that can be used uh, in, sec in stroke secondary to giant cell arthritis? Um, Best treatment, that, that, that's a difficult question because in giant cell arthritis, different from what I showed you about MS or um, NMO, there has been no comparative study, for instance, comparing steroids against tocilizumab. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the, what the answer is. I, I personally um, would start with steroids, but if the patient uh, needs an in, inacceptably high dose, we today here in, in my hospital, at least, we start putting them on tocilizumab. That, that's the, the IL-6 receptor antibody that I showed you. But, but there has been no comparative study between different uh, drugs in the giant cell arthritis field. Okay, any question from the audience or from the panelists? Or... Uh, of course, for the um, interesting finding about the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and that we started to have uh, a light at the end of the tunnel with this um, uh, very marvelous step, actually. Uh, anything about uh, markers helping also in diagnosis? Um, yes, they have um, the neurofilament in the CSF. That's certainly a new one. Uh, that's, that's, it's not specific, of course. You, you may also get it in other conditions such as um, Kreuzfeld-Jakob or so, so rapid um, loss of neurons or so rapid destruction of neurons. But, but um, there have been a number of studies, I think in 2019, uh, showing that See, a neurofilament in the CSF is, is quite a specific thing uh, that you can support your di ALS diagnosis with. Right. And as you know, as you know, Dr. Mahmoud, Germans like doing lumbar punctures. We do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> doing doing much right. More you, much more than you. So we do it. Yeah. Okay. Any, more questions? Any more questions, Dr. Mahmoud? Uh, of course, if you left to me until uh, downtime, I keep. <laughs> no, I don't yeah, any wish to 
have much for Dr. Helmut, but uh, I wish to thank him very, very much. It's like a good a poetry today. And we have a very... <laughs> thank you very much and uh, hoping to see you more and more. And uh, it's a very good selection. Yani, this is now Dr. Helmut School, inshallah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, you Bro Helmut, for this very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, point all the, neuro, uh, the neurology subspecialty, and uh, I hope we will see you again. I hope so too, and hopefully this year. <laughs> see, see you. Sure. you. Thank, Thank you, you. so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Assalamu. Assalamu. Bye bye. <laughs>